Good. So for those who don't know, uh, all the faces here other than me are very prominent people in the community. You should be knowing them already. Uh, but Justin is an open source advisor at UNICEF. Uh, he's, been, he's been doing a lot of things in Fedora for many, many years. He was founding member of PEI, uh, ComOps, and so many things. I should quick introduction too. So many things to pick from. Marie is our Fedora Community Action and Impact Coordinator. She works on a lot of things in uh, community, but also leads DEI and design side of things. Sumantro has been a Fedora QV member who was also the one to introduce me to Fedora a long time. And uh, you would have seen him uh, sending emails a lot around test days and things, but he would also be doing Google Summer of Code side of mentorship or, or, or admin uh, since 2018, if I'm not wrong. And Ankur has started Neuro Fedora, Fedora Join. He was a packager. He's been around for almost a decade, if not, more, maybe more than a decade. I don't know. It's been a long, long, more than a decade, exactly. And Ankur has been mentoring a lot of people every day as part of not just Neuro Fedora, but Fedora Join, which we all point to whenever someone new comes. I'm really interested in he hearing all of your perspectives. So why don't we go around and you tell us about yourself a little bit. I would start with Justin since I see him on my left hand side, the first person here. Yeah, thanks. So uh, my name is Justin. Uh, I've been involved with Fedora since probably 2015. I guess my mentorship journey. So inside Fedora, I was originally a GSOC 2016 student when I was 18 or 19. Uh, I was an outreachy mentor in 2019 for the Fedora Happiness Packets project. And then I've just been various connected to various different mentoring and, and uh, initiatives throughout Fedora, like ComOps, where we've spent a lot of time thinking about mentorship as well. Um, outside Fedora, I've also done been more involved with mentorship on doing student programs at my former university, where we had a really big open source uh, community there. And I also do mentorship as a job these days. Um, what I do in my role is I actually work with different startup companies from around the world that are building open source tech, and I teach them and provide mentorship on open source best practices, licenses and legal, um, a lot of things that I've actually learned from being around in, in Fedora. So. Uh, I'll go ahead and pass it over to Sumantro. So thanks, Justin. Uh, first of all, you know, most of the stuff is already available. Uh, nothing much to add there. I When I joined as a contributor back in 16, um, I was like, I would look up to Ankur and Justin and many other folks, uh, Matthew specifically, you know, read on five things about Fedora and what's going on. Things have changed a lot since then. Now, now I know that I'm doing some of these things. Uh, but yeah, I, I, as a part of my day job, I host test days. I take charge of the Fedora OS side of things. Uh, so, you know, testing most of these things and working towards making Fedora more stable for consumption. Uh, I also kind of run a lot of uh, light learn kind of test cases for different packages which have been introduced to Fedora. So something new in GNOME comes, I usually go and write some of these test cases, which then come in the ones. I used to do a lot of GSOC stuff, which has not been happening now. Uh, with a lot of COVID and Fedora not being there as a part of all, unfortunately. But yeah, the idea here is to you know take the mentorship skills and still try to fit in to multiple so I collaborate mostly with the uh, world. I used to do a lot of uh, these things with Bex earlier, and currently I'm leading this objective with Murray and Mariana for the community outreach program, where they go around try to fix the Amazon program that we teach you the Amazon program. We had a nice one about it yesterday. So. Any ambassador who is over here, uh, if you want to join in, look out for a recording from previously. Uh, that's all about me. I'm going to pass it down to Uncle. Thanks, Amandro. Um, yeah, so as Vipul said, I've been around for a while. Um, and I wouldn't be here if I hadn't been mentored when I started. So. Uh, other folks that have been around for a while would have heard of Kushal Das and Rahul Sundaram. 
uh, these were all people that worked for Red Hat, um, and they were extremely active uh, in the Fedora India side of things. And a lot of us started because they ho they held uh, tutorials and workshops regularly, and they were always there to mentor us. Um, and that's how so many of us are still around because um, they didn't just teach us the skills; they taught us how to be part of the community. Um, they also organized FoodCon in Pune, you know, the FoodCon days, which you don't have anymore. And um, that's how, yeah, Matthew just noted that uh, Rahul and Kushal also came from community participation, which is true. Um, and yeah, so so basically, um, they didn't just teach us all the tech bits about Fedora, but they taught us the importance of community and the importance of sharing all the knowledge you gain. And I guess that's why I end up on all of these forums, just randomly answering questions here and asking questions here and there. Um, unfortunately, my day job now is not very closely related to software development. I now work in academia, so it's a lot of science. Um, yeah, and the time is short in academia. I think everybody knows that we're underpaid and overworked, and that does apply in my job also. Um, but the good thing is that my job has a massive open science component. Um, and the whole idea of having your Fedora was to try and find something common between my Fedora family and work so that, you know, I could do something that sort of benefited both. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, looking forward to speaking to all of you about all your experiences, and I'm sure I'll learn something from everybody. Um, Marie, I guess you're the next one. Thanks. Hi, I'm Marie Norton. I am Fedora's Community Action and Impact Coordinator. And I could say, without a doubt, I wouldn't be here without being mentored um, in the Fedora community. So had a huge impact on my life and kind of where I went with my career. But since then, I've also um, started to be a mentor and I've mentored through the Outreachy program. I think I'm about, I'm in my fourth session of mentoring and they've all been graphic design um, whether it's for the outreach revamp or we did a fedora zine and this time around we're revamping the badge artwork um, so a lot of fun brand type stuff for fedora which i always feel like we're lacking so i love to put some energy and time into that area um, and yeah otherwise I, I do badges, I've done badges for a very long time, and as FK, I'm pretty much all over on the Mindshare side of Fedora, helping and supporting everything on that side with the teams, but then just in general doing events and uh, budget stuff and all kinds of logistics um, for the community. Great. Okay, uh, thank you. I can hear you now. My mic was showing off. I guess it's not a good day for me with Hopin. Uh, so, you know, we were just in Mike's keynote and he was talking about how what mentorship is and how it benefits others. Continuing on that conversation, I want to ask, what are some common misconceptions about mentorships? Uh, and how can we combat those? Uh, it's about mentoring or being mentored. What are the expectations that usually people have? Is there anything that jumps out to you? That, okay, these are very generic misconception about that. Um, I have one, and um, with mentoring, I've real. I mean, I had this before I started mentoring. Um, and my misconception was, and this is because I, I mean, I've seen people mentor in different ways, and my misconception was that mentoring is a passive process, where it is pretty much responding to queries when. So people ask you email, send you emails, ask you questions, and your job is to answer questions. Um, and then at some point I started teaching a little bit, and then I've done Outreachy previously. I've done Google Summer of Code previously. I'm doing Outreachy again, not from not with Fedora, from work. So I'm on both sides of the fence here. But what I realized was that mentoring is a lot is a very, very active process where you have to ask all your candidates how they're doing, how they're feeling, um, are the tasks good enough? Do we need to scale back the difficulty of tasks or increase difficulty, that kind of thing. Um, so it's not just about waiting for your candidates to reach out to you. You need to actively reach out to them. Um, and it also works in a, in a way to make sure that they are actually actively working on things. And if they have questions, they know that you're always there for them. Yeah, so my misconception was that it's a passive process. It really isn't. Um, it needs to be an active process. And the mentor needs to uh, put aside time and resources 
to make sure that they can reach out regularly to all the candidates and see how they're doing. That was my one. I'll think of more. I'm sure I have many, but that's the first one. And that's a very good one. Uh, I so, can relate to that. I have been mentored, and even I have been, when I go into some of the conversations, a lot of the time I do not have agendas, or I, I just go into those thinking I'll be told something, which is not exactly a right way to do that, as Mike was telling earlier in the keynote. So that was my misconception that we'll figure out together what to work on. It should also come from mentee on exactly what would they like to go saying. Do we have anyone else who would like to share something? So I had a couple. So first of all, I think, you know, when I looked at mentorship previously, there was one of these very usual factors is if it is easy to do for me, it is easy to do for almost anyone. That's a very unconscious bias that comes into the children when I you know, back in the day when I used to start doing this. If I can do this under one and a half hour, this should be easily for you. Done by anybody in one and a half hour. That's not actually the expectation to set while you were deciding a deadline. So we used to decide those deadlines for uh, GSOC cutoffs, weekly cutoffs for what you're maybe supposed to deliver. And you know, setting these, some of these hard deadlines just because it's deliverable was not actually a very good precedent to set in the getting the It's one of my um, one of my learnings when it came to you know. Okay, the, everyone has their own way of getting around things, navigating things. And that, that should be respected. Uh, also, terms uh, comes with uh, you know a lot of accessibility factors. So I am someone who is um, who is kind suffers kind of from a attention deficit uh, sort of problem. So I can understand when somebody comes to me and says, "Hey, uh, can you read this thing for two and a half hours?" That's that's not that's not my thing. Like I would probably take that two and a half hours into multiple chunks and do it. So, you know, having accessibility in mind when you're mentoring is one of those very key things you can do to make your mentee's life much easier. So it's it's also, it comes attached with the process and it also comes attached with the expectation. So that, those are the two key things that you know, I thought was very easy to do. But then when I got getting things done, I got to form them. Oh, yeah, this requires a lot of I have something to add here. Um, Jeez. Yeah, so I guess I'm not sure I had this misconception, but I think it might be a common one, is that mentorship is a one-on, it needs to be a one-on-one -on -one situation, and it really doesn't. Group mentorship is a great way to approach this. Um, and it takes some of the pressure off of like all one person, you know, always needing to be there in the channel, always needing to be able to respond. Um, so, you know, co-mentoring in a very official capacity is great. But like, if you look at the joint SIG, we have just a group of people who are ready to support like 24 hours a day. So that's a great example of how group mentorship works and it works for Fedora. Yeah, uh, Justin, and yeah, and just to build on that, I I think that like it was mentioned in Mike's keynote, you know, there's different kinds of mentorship, and what misconceptions or, or best practices make sense for one type of mentorship might not make sense for another one. Like, say, if you're mentoring someone on their career, which is kind of a much more personal mentorship, versus like I'm working with this person on a project together, and I'm kind of like mentoring them on this this technical task. Um, so I think looking at it from the Fedora context, I think one of the misconceptions that I sometimes have have noticed, I think on that project side of mentorship is, you know, that there's one way of doing things or that there's a, there's a certain fixed direction you have to go, but I think really keeping it flexible, both as a mentor in the perspective of being flexible and easy, quick to adapt and, and make changes as needed, but also with the mentee, making sure that they can uh, if you're working on a project and you have goals together that you're 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 having that open communication and making sure that it's meeting the needs of the mentee, but also making sure that you can sustain the mentorship as the mentor. That, that's amazing. And I remember Sumantra was talking about communication and you mentioned sustainability of contributors. So we'll come back to both of them. 
I wanted to ask each one of you, what are your preferred way of communication to your mentees? We'll start with uh, Sumantra again. Uh, sorry, sure. Ankur again. Um, I um, yeah, I if it's Fedora work, I default to open. Um, so we almost didn't have any private communication, any private emails. Everything happened. Um, for for example, for the previous round of outreach, we had a ticket on the near Fedora uh, Paga instance. And all our communications happen through them. So every week we would decide what tasks we were going to do that week. Um, and at the end of the week, we would review these. Um, everything, including blog posts, troubleshooting, everything happened on the ticket. And of course, for synchronous communication, we had um, the NeuroFedora channel. And as Marie said, the advantage of this was that it wasn't just me answering questions. So all the package maintainers that are part of the NeuroFedora SIG were always replying and you know, helping out in the channel. Um, and especially in the now, this is a little specific to outreach and may not apply to all um, mentoring, well, projects. But outreach, initially, you we tend to get a lot of candidates. So for NeuroFedora, we had almost 30 candidates, um, unfortunately, for only one, for only one uh, position. Um, but the good thing was, because we mentored them as a community, they helped each other. There was so much discussion between candidates helping them themselves out. People were scrolling up and down the chat logs because they were running into similar issues, so they could just go back and see what was going on. And even though we only took on one candidate, we actually had four people who got sponsored to the package maintainers team as part of this outreach, right? So, so we did everything in the open, no private communication. Um, and that way, it's not only does the New Fedora team know what's going on, anybody who wants to see what's going on just goes to the ticket or goes to the chat channel and they'll see all of our outreach candidates just actively, you know, going package A, package B, put a request here. Like, it is really, really nice to do it that way. Samantha? So, yeah, exactly like Uncle said, right? I de facto open, but then um, I have, I kind of profile a lot of candidates. So when I look at my 90s and I'm kind of sure these are going to be I would probably go ahead and um, ask them how do they feel. So if they're like three time zones away and probably have a very bad internet connection and horrible restrictions and all, if they use their work laptop or incognito or something like a friend's machine or something like that. In that case, I would probably um, ask them to reach out over and or something. Just to help them out with regular communication so that they don't have to go through the whole uh, process of setting up new end software it's just to communicate with me as a mentor. That drops the burden. But uh, yeah, in, in most of the cases, uh, communication is play a great part in mentoring, which also means the faster you reply, the more attention span you have and the mind share you have. But um, when it's a as a project in Fedora, whenever I look at somebody who has to work with ready and three, four other teams, then I would probably ask this one person to reach out to four other people, either on a public list or a private list, how they would prefer, and then establish a wrap up before you know getting negative insights out. So that, that's that has been my motto with or my mode of telling people getting started, how to get started. So, yeah, thank you, Marie. Cool. So, I like a hybrid approach. Um, so, I actually really enjoy video calls with my mentees. Um, I do a, like establish like you can chat me if you want. Like once the intern has been chosen through Outreachy, but everything I do at the beginning is in the channel. Um, just there's a lot of common questions, so we keep that whole application period right there in the channel. Then otherwise, I, you know, kind of personalize the approach, as Sumatra said, and I ask them, you know, what's the best fit for you? I've had, you know, people not prefer to do video calls. They will, like, I'll join and do audio, but I don't like sharing my video, and that's totally fine. Um, I think that the video call really brings like a personal connection with between you and the mentee um, and allows you to like build the relationship. Also with some of the work that I do, it's less um, like code repo based 
work and its design and um, a lot of it, there's a lot of right answers. So I want to help um, my mentee find you know, their right answer. So oftentimes that means giving like demos, right? Um, and, and taking some of that time on the on a video call to really get into like, how do I use this tool in Inkscape? And I'll also like watch them work in Inkscape and say like, hey, did you know you could do the shortcut or like this? this is actually going to be a much simpler way to approach the problem you're looking at um, or just like really laying down some of the basics of working with vector graphics right so um, i like the video chats but i also you know tailor it to each intern or each mentee i definitely relate to that i have also felt a lot of the times on video calls or when you are meeting a little bit more privately you tend to feel more connected to people and uh, uh, default to open is great, obviously, because it helps so many people. Uh, but I would sometimes I would also prefer to connect more with my mentees, just also looking from the sustainable perspective of them in long term. Uh, but Justin, uh, what do you think? Yeah, I kind of feel like there's there's three three parts I feel for this question is and kind of prefacing like specific tools. Uh, I think around communication in general, the best communication is the one that happens. Uh, one of the kind of biggest misconceptions that I see around interns or, or around internships in general or mentorship is uh, you know, being afraid to ask that question or that the mentor is gonna be like really busy or I always try to like break that misconception or just trying to make sure that there's an open, safe, comfortable environment where people can ask questions and you know, ask, get that clarity they need to be successful in their own work. So I really try to encourage that, you know, I think kind of building on that piece around open communication in public groups and public chats, that can really help with that. If you have a really, uh, if you have like a community and a bit of a, of a active chat there, but for me in my own mentorships, I kind of split it up between formal and informal ways of engagement. So when I'm working with someone more formally, like on a project or, um, something that's kind of more tied to work, you know, that might look like having daily standups just over a text message or a chat, maybe having weekly video calls to check in, because I do agree kind of building out what Marie said. It's like, I do think that's a really important part for getting that connection. Um, and then uh, I also put spreadsheets because I think that can be, <laughs> I think spreadsheets are almost like one kind of love language, especially in project management and mentorship, is it can just help keep some kind of uh, clarity or whether it's a project board or spreadsheet, you know, but just having some kind of organization to keep things on track and make sure that you and your mentee are are consistently going through things together and, and reviewing things that need to be worked on. But more informally, it could just be chat. It could be video. It could be a Twitter message. It could be LinkedIn. You know, things, communication can happen in all kinds of different places. And um, I think on part, one part is meeting people where they're at and trying to help bring them into the fold. Uh, you know, so sometimes you might have to do a little bit of one-on-one -on -one chat because sometimes people are more comfortable in that way, but ultimately trying to bring them into the fold of the community too. Um, but I think kind of the essence of the question, you know, it's about communication method. Um, you know, I think open communication is good and mentorship doesn't have to happen uh, within a project or with a direct colleague of yours. And that can change what that pace of mentorship might look like. So if you're working with someone more regularly, maybe that's a daily check-in that you're chatting with them on video or on call or on text. But if it's something a little less formal or maybe on a different direction than say a project you're both immediately working on, you know, you can find a pace that works best for you. Like maybe it's a monthly check-in chat or, um, or like just emailing back and forth here and there. But I think the key thing is that the pace is always going to be contextual, to, but just make sure that you're keeping that spark alive between uh, mentor and mentee. Thank you. Uh, great answers, and uh, I'm loving it. Now I wanted to jump into some of your personal experiences. Do you remember a specific uh, experience during your mentorship duration where you wished you had done something differently? Uh, or if you were to do it over, how would you do it differently? We are not going to follow the same uh, pattern here. Whoever wants to speak first can go. So 
Yeah, so let me think. Uh, back in the days, I've been mentoring for about two and a half years. And previously, when I used to mentor, there used to be a whiteboard where I used to write how about these things and then ask people how, how these things fit into the equation. Right? And that, that used to be crazy fun because you get to smell nice markers after the end of the day. <laughs> but uh, jokes apart, um, back in the day, um, there was a certain speed that I used to play. And again, that came from the bias that if I can go at this speed and cover X, Y, Z, P, Q, R, things under three days, four days, seven months, it should be a very easy thing to um, grab. And that's that's not always, that wasn't always the point. Uh, the other thing is mentorship uh, for me was always like, if people have taught me something, then I need to give this back to the community. That used to be a thing back in the mind when I used to do it, right? So a lot of times I used to, um, what happened was when I used to put a lot of important people in the room, or rather some of the mentees in the room, and I don't personally enjoy mentoring them because I am doing it because I think I'm giving back to community. And I used to rush through things, and that's not ideally the best way to get things done. Now, if I were to do it opposite now today, I would probably spend an awful lot of time understanding my patients. What are their final goals with it? Like exactly like um, Mike said in his keynote, right? Understand what your mentees' final you know, goals are. Like, don't try to put decisions on them or rather take decisions for them. So, because writing a shell script for you probably is like the two minute task, but when you do them, you cripple them out of their choice or their journey to write their first shell script out there, right? And that's that's not a very good thing. So, if, if I were to actually, you know, go about re-mentoring some of these people, I would give them the liberty to write awful wrong things, awful do whatever they felt like, just to profile them for, for a good some time and tell them, hey, you wanted to go here. There are multiple ways to go there, not just one. And I would give them that choice to you know choose their choice one. That 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 would be the, the remodeling I would be doing. But this time I would be focusing more on how they would try to reach it rather than the clear vision that I have in my brain to push them towards it. So that's that's one remodeling I, I, I wish I could can do back in four years of all the other people that all the thousand people that I would mentored. <laughs> so yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? So I think I have one here. Um it's important to get on the same page with your team before you start mentoring someone in that team. <laughs> um, just to make sure like they're prepared and they know that people are coming. And because um, with the outreach you specifically, like it's a huge influx of people. And if everyone isn't prepared for that, that can be very disconcerting um, for other folks on your team. So I think one time I really was not as clear as I should have been. Like, this is about to happen. Um, people are like, what? what's happened? Like, what? There's all these people here, you know? So um, it wasn't necessarily related to that person's work. It was something we were doing kind of separately. So it just didn't, you know, it was one of those things like, man, I really probably should have had a talk. You know, we're going to be using this channel. Um, so just making sure that other people are aware of what you're doing in the project. Um, this one's not mine personally, but one that I've seen happen is uh, kind of building off what Sumatra said is um, I like basically thinking that the intern's going to get through more than they are. Um, a, you know, writing out too much work for a three month internship um, because it's really uh, at least the first month is just them figuring things out. Um, and then it's like the second and third month when they truly become productive and you can actually be like, look how far you've come and they feel it too. Um, but um, trying to put too much um, down is 
for the project is maybe one of our shortcomings in Fedora, right? Like we say, hey, I know we had like a badges back and in intern once and like I could not find out what that person did or how it translated to the website. And so um, I think, you know, maybe there was just too much in that scope. I can follow on that too. Just thinking of one thing that happened uh, in 2019 with the Fedora internship. So I guess the, the high level piece here is just on mentor to mentor communication and networking. Um, so in 2019, we had outreachy and GSOC projects. And that year we actually had selected for one of the internships, the same person for a GSOC and an outreachy internship. And uh, we were like, oh, wait, that, and then we had to go back and like go through things and we had to kind of uh, re go back to the organizations about how we were going to select the interns. But, you know, I think that point of that was that um, both among mentors, we always weren't coordinating or synced up with each other. But more generally, I think being able to have that uh, mentor to mentor networking and just connections and check ins. That's really helpful to build those feedback loops out between mentors. And I see it both from a logistics point of view that like you know, you're, you're having different mentor, uh, people participating in both projects and you should probably be on the same page about your selections for the project in a, in a larger community. Um, but also uh, looking at common tools and approaches that the mentors can share. I think that's probably one of the, and this isn't just in Fedora, but in a lot of communities, I see this, that when you have more of a sustained networking program, just making sure that as the mentors, you can, you're building out common resources or tools so that you can be more, consistent and standard on certain approaches, like say, how do you bring someone into the Fedora community? Making sure all the mentors have the same general processes for that. So everyone's more aligned and using the same information and the same resources. So we're all steering someone in the right direction. Um, so I think that's probably one of the biggest areas and, and we've been making a lot of strides in that direction too. Like I think this mentor summit is a really awesome example of that, of really trying to bring mentors and folks who are doing this kind of work together and, and have these conversations. But um, I, I think that's a really important part. And I see this becoming more and more important also outside of a Fedora context. So I guess just really making sure that in a mentored mentorship program that your mentors are actually talking with each other and that they're working on solving common problems based on you know whatever's going on in the organization or for the projects over. So listening to everyone answer, the, from what I get the most out of it is scoping the project is one of the very important things. And that also contains mentors talking to each other and defining exactly what their project is. Uh, as Marie is saying and was saying, conflicting answers can often confuse people. So this is a very open-ended question. And from what I'm taking from this specific thing is to find some resources on how can I guide mentors to scope projects better as someone who is doing mentorship projects in federal project, right? But from your experiences of mentorship, what are some of the things you follow to scope a project well? Um, well, the way we did it was um, we tried to break, I mean, luckily our project is, it's packaging, right? It's lots of small tasks rather than one massive task. And the way we tried to do it was we tried to break all of these tasks down into the smallest possible tasks that can be done. And that way we were able to spread out individual tasks over the complete period, right? So, I mean, packaging a software can sometimes take two days, sometimes it can take four weeks, but there are multiple steps to doing it. And the way we assigned tasks, well, the way we agreed on tasks with our candidates was to say, this stage of this task is this week. And if you can do that, then that's a successful week. And only then do we think about the next stage. So we tried to break it down into small bits. Um, we did not have a, a list of tasks that must be completed. We just had lots of tasks and we said, just keep going through them as you as you will. And uh, the number of tasks that you've completed is not a metric we're going to use to decide whether or not um, your candidate period was successful or not, right? So we, so we completely did not take that metric into account. Um, we didn't actually have a metric. The way the way I did it with Vanessa was, um, did she think she was getting work done? Did, did she think she was learning? And of course, um, 
with the package review process, I'm I'm tried my best to push them into requesting reviews from people who were not me. Right. So so go and reach out to other package maintainers from the community and get them to review. And that way, I mean, all of this stuff was already being checked in in the standard peer review fashion by everybody else. Um, yeah. So to try and break it down to small things, it also, as we've discussed, scoping the project is very very hard. So it helped me not overestimate the amount of work that can be done in a week because these are small tasks. Um, yeah. So I think that had worked quite well for me. But yeah, I mean, the caveats to all of this: if the task is too small and um, the candidate doesn't think that they're being given uh, a task of sufficient complexity, then you know, then sometimes uh, the confidence can waver because they might think that the mentor thinks that they're not technically as good. So it's a constant back and forth between, uh, yeah, the communication is is key before setting tasks on, on a big scale. Yeah. So, so ideally, you and you did yourself. So ideally when a task is being decided or in any milestone is being decided, I take into account three factors. The first thing is usually an idea with, with all the resources available online and community by your side. What is the ideal time period this this particular explore task is gonna be? The first factor. The second factor is always the impact of the project. So how much part of actual work have you will be able to complete if you were able to nail down the first 10 tasks? It's like writing the question paper uh, with the questions having the most number of marks first so that you know you have answered the most. You know, if you have answered correctly, you have nailed down most of the paper correct. Like that, that's, that's, the, that's the way that I would put it. It's a it's a twisted uh, exam analogy that we Indians really have. Uncle and people might read it, uh, but yeah, you know, it's like uh, that, that's the way. So for the second thing and third thing is obviously going to be more about how can you go about finding resources. One thing that I have found out over time is there are too many resources and too many options are confusing to candidates. Right, so giving them a pool of pre-made resources by your mentor always helps because then the mentor speaks the same lingo as the mentee and they kind of know what exact thing they are talking about. So, you know, when I say watch this video, read this article, practice and look at this code base, and if the mentee has done that sequentially, right, I probably know exactly where they're going to get stuck and if they're not going to get stuck, then what else can be these are the three usual um, ways that I look about when I define a task for anybody. Um, any, anything that requires two hours, I usually take it like um, should take at least six hours given the, the pressure every mentee men is in. Uh, one thing that we almost forget is when we do our days out as mentors. We forget that uh, mentees are under a lot of pressure to kind of prove that they can do something, right? And then that pressure keeps building up if they start failing uh, on the deadlines. And that's one thing. That's one thing that I keep in mind when I design tasks so that if they fail on a particular point, they have a they have a time they can go back and fix it at the end of the project, in the middle of the project, somewhere. In the so, yeah, that's one. Uh, uh, so looking at the time, uh, I want us to move a little quicker because I have a few interesting questions that I want to ask just for myself and learn about it, right? And also in the end, if we have more questions for others. Uh, does anyone else have quick. anything? I can try to go quick, yes. Oh, please, but yes. I have, a, I have a few points. So when I look at these design projects, which sometimes are big projects or a cluster of small projects, um, I have my like base minimum and then I have a bunch of extras, right? That aren't necessarily out there. It's not something the intern even knows that I have ready to go, but I have, it just, it depends on how quickly they learn and just presenting that first task and then like saying, okay, now we're going to move to the next. And if they're prolific and they're just like getting through all this stuff, I have a bunch of stuff ready to go. Um, that I've already thought about and said, this is the bonus work that can happen if we get to that 
point. I think the other thing that I like to just point out and have people think about is for me, yes, I have the goal of getting this task done, but I have other goals. And my other goals are one, the intern gets something out of it. So that's really important. You want them to have like a positive experience. But number two, that they have a, an amazing experience with the Fedora community, right? So I want the mentorship and all of that to 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 feel so welcoming and um and and positive for them that they want to stay involved in fedora and they want to continue to hang out because they see the value in it and because they've gotten something rewarding out of it so i'm going to stop there to keep it brief justin would you like to add something I just I was asking you if you would like to add something. Let me unmute. I think you're with us now. I yeah, now you're unmuted. I, I can hear you now. Uh, I well. Maybe let's move to the next question. Yes, let's move to the next question. Uh, this is a pretty difficult question because I'm asking on the face. What are some of the bottlenecks in our current way of mentoring? What are some of the things in Federal Project we can improve right now? Uh, Murray, why don't you start? Yes, yes. Um, so I think it might be just not knowing that it's an option um, and not knowing that like most people can do this with some small amount of training. And I think what adds to that is the time commitment. Like people are afraid that this is going to take too much time and that it's all going to be on them, right? So we talked about co-mentoring as an option, which is great so the, there's less pressure on you. So I think you know, letting people know that this can happen, but I think it takes a little bit even more of a personalized approach. Like um, actually thinking about who would be a good mentor, who might be a good fit for this and talking with them one on one about their doubts about their you know fears about you know why they can't do it and helping them to break through those and come up with some solutions to move past it so that's kind of my thought yeah anyone else what are the bottlenecks or challenges we have right now or how can we improve our mentorship ways in the federal project i think just in back I think one way, to do, uh, one way to do that is very nice to incentivize and reward the mentors for spending their time with mentors. One thing that we essentially have not done before is we have gamified, incentivized people over, over the board across everything except mentors. And we heavily rely on the fact that Google does that for Google Mentor Summit. And the only problem with Mentor Summit previously GCI was the same, was Google in 80% of the times would have only two slots for mentors and only one person would be able to travel. Right? And the federal would not have the budget for travel happening for mentors. And most of our very important mentors, in fact, Daniel Walsh mentor for the you know, it would be nice to have him travel. Path, right? So that, that one thing I think would be a good thing we can do. That's true. That's it. Yeah, uh, I guess also about uh, a lot about how mentors see the reward mechanism, what works for them. Uh, I was talking to Pingu yesterday and he was mentioning how at this point in career, I mean, this point in his life, uh, in his career, he's in, say, swag or uh, a trip because his family, he may not want to travel with all these things. That's not necessarily the reward he's looking at. And he's doing it because he's at the point of in his career where he would like to help out. And he was saying, because I was talking to about him something similar, I was discussing the panel discussion. And he said, if you are early in your career and you're mentoring, then your reward is that you get to talk about it. You get to talk about, you learn how to mentor, you have you gain certain experiences, you have got a mentee. But yes, uh, after this question, I would definitely like to jump back on some of the reward incentive, reward uh, reward ways and mechanism and 
how to incentivize mentors. Uh, but focusing on this current question, because I do want to identify certain pain points in our current way of mentoring. What everyone else thinks here? Yeah, I can I can build on that. So thinking of some bottlenecks that I've seen in Fedora mentorship, I, I think, and, and kind of more broadly too here, but I, I see three common threads, which is one, I think something we've kind of talked about a lot on and off throughout this panel, but in being in silos, that, that networking and that connection, making sure that your mentorship isn't happening in a pressure cooker isolated from the rest of the, the project, I think is really important. Um, another one that I mentioned previously was just on having more mentor, net, mentor to mentor networking and connections. Uh, but my last one is also, I think on, for mentors, especially on the sustainability factor, like being able to have a graceful exit or having permission to leave. You know, I think that's something that People really love to be in the project and be involved. And sometimes it's just, there's, you know, life happens, things change, you have a family, you know. I, so I think always being able to give people that option to have that graceful exit, just like we do in other parts of the project too, um, with mentorship, I think is really important. For the reward mechanism of mentorship, I, I think there maybe there's some things that can be pulled out here too, but I see it kind of, there's some intrinsic ones, but also on the career side, like on in the intrinsic side, you, you get to have that option to really work with someone and empower another person in, in their own journey, whether that's for a career or for personal growth, whatever kind of direction it is. Uh, and also you gain a new perspective to some kind of work. Like, you know, especially when you're in a project, like Matthew said earlier, Fedora has been around for 20 years. When you've been in that mix for even just a couple years, you start to see things in a different way. So having someone who's a total newcomer and hasn't seen these kind of things before, that's a really helpful perspective. Um, and then lastly, I'll try to leave some room for everyone else to come in here, but just three things that I was thinking about that we could do to better attract mentors in Fedora is one is around acknowledgement and recognition, which I think ties into some of Marie's work around the, the RISE initiative, um, but really being able to like, acknowledge the work that mentors do and provide some kind of acknowledgement or endorsement of their participation with the community in this way. Uh, Second is community and connection, just making sure that we're building that community of, of mentors and mentees, like this mentor summit, I think is a great example. And then finally, just continuing to foster mentor mentee interactions, like at previous uh, flocks, you know, we'd have um, like meet and greets for the interns, or there'd be the, the internship presentation panel. Um, I think just, and, and, and even candy swaps. I remember people talking like at, when we would do those at Flocks, people bring candy from all over the world and we swap them with each other. You know, and people actually have a lot of really great interactions and get to know people in a different way there than just like, here's the, the project in C that we're working on. And this is, you know, it, there's more to the community than that. So um, I see those three things as ways that would help us uh, attract more mentors in, in Fedora. And, and yes, the pull, the Swedish candies are, Everyone has to try those. <laughs> Everyone. It's an experience. Ankur, uh, I just wanted to, before going on next question, I wanted to hear your thoughts. Well, I think, I think I'll just be echoing what everybody else has said. But um, yeah, I think mentoring as a community as opposed to individuals would be, would be very, very nice. And I, I think we are moving in that direction because I think we do now channel all our candidates through the Fedora join process and everybody has a welcome to Fedora ticket. So they, by default, get lots of people answering questions and helping them out. But it will be good if we can encourage more community members to uh, to just stay involved, right? I mean, don't become, they don't have to become the mentor officially as the central point of contact, but just keeping an eye on these tickets and helping people out so that, um, A, as people have said, it takes the pressure off the primary mentor and the co-mentor. But it also helps integrate the candidate better with the whole community, right? So they're not always talking to the same two people. So yeah, I think we are we are moving in that direction because we are. Um, I mean, if anybody goes to the Welcome to Fedora page, uh, Fedora project, I'll drop a link. You'll see that for candidates, we now have a tag that says mentoring, which clearly says that all of these people are interested in outreach or Google Summer of Code or so on and so forth. So if you can subscribe to that, just you'll get notifications. There'll be simple questions. If you're a community member, you will usually know the answer. Just help people out. I think that would be a good way of going about it. We have three minutes. And
I have sorry, suddenly my internet. So I was saying I didn't scope this panel discussion very well. I have way too many questions prepared and two minutes time. I wanted to ask, is there anything we are leaving out that needs to be addressed right now to everyone? So I think you're asking in context of Fedora specific mentorship programs. Sure, if that's what you want to talk about. I just want to ask you, did you have any expectation from this panel discussion that we are leaving out, which would be, have been very important? I think this I know Justin was about to say something. Sorry, sorry. Uh, so th this has been a very interesting conversation to hear mindsets and thoughts. Yeah, I think just my closing thought is that mentorship is always a journey and that it's something that there's no one size fits all approach. And I think just keeping that in mind as we continue to work on some of these ways to improve our mentorship approach will be really helpful for our own mentorship program, but also for Fedora more widely as a project in community. Over. I guess I'd just like to see some of these ideas and conversations translated into some process improvements or updates for our mentorship program, for our documentation. So I loved this conversation and I think it, it would be helpful for, for more folks than who are just here with us today to hear some of this and see it out, out in the community. Perfect. Thank you very much. We are out of the time, unfortunately. I would have loved to keep going.